Rosalind Peterson is an environmental impact analyst and founder of California Skywatch. Today, Rosalind is a leader in the fight to expose the true nature of the chemicals being sprayed in our skies. She has compiled extensive data documenting the ongoing geoengineering and weather modification programs contaminating our skies, water, and food supply. My name is Rosalind Peterson and I was born and raised in Mendocino County in California. I was on a working farm in Mendocino County and uh, grew up on a working farm. So I have a background in agriculture. I could drive a cat tractor. I could do the irrigation systems. I decided to take environmental studies and planning course at Sonoma State University where I got my degrees. After some training, I became an agriculture crop loss adjuster, which meant that if there were any crops that failed in California for any reason, crop loss adjusters were sent by the state of California to go investigate where these crop losses were and why there were crop losses throughout the state. So I was traveling about 50,000 miles a year in this process from county to county, assessing what kind of crops, uh, what kind of damage they had, and looking into the reasons for the failure itself and how much value the crop was that, that was lost at that particular time. And then if there was a crop loss that was legitimate, then ranchers or farmers could be paid crop insurance uh, for the loss of their crops. In 98, I began to notice just a little bit of tree decline on the property here. I began to notice that some trees didn't look as healthy, and I, and I started to worry about that just in the background as something that was nagging because I was concerned about losing the beautiful trees we have around here. Then in early 2000, I began to notice that I would see jets, and they would leave these little tiny trails and then the sky would white out after that and I was always irritated because our skies used to be so crystal clear and blue and gorgeous and all of a sudden you would see these jets and I kind of thought of them almost as joyriding and when they were or sky riding and when they did this then the sky would haze over and so I found myself when I was teaching tennis and being outdoors all the time or uh, traveling uh, for work that I was irritated a little bit about the idea that the skies were hazed over a lot. So that was the first inkling. And then in 2002, um, I was working for the Mendocino County Probation Department. I was on a lunch break and a friend of mine stopped me and dragged me into his office and said, what do you know about this? And I said, nothing. And so he said, well, he said, look, he said, I want you to know that that something is strange is happening here and I'm really concerned about it. My brother, um, who's in the military, is concerned about this and has called me a couple of times to say he was concerned that there was something here that was going on that was not quite right. He couldn't go any further but he did take me outside that lunch hour and say today is a really bad day and that's when he really brought my attention to watching the jets and how the jets would leave a small trail and then it would expand into these huge plumes. And at that particular juncture of time, that day, I was in and bought a pair of binoculars after work and a camera and I started taking pictures and watching what was going on. And that day I had never seen so many jets flying in so many directions leaving so many huge plumes that turned into the, you know, small trails that turned into these huge plumes in my life. And I knew that something was wrong. And that started me investigating what was going on. In the beginning, when I first began to see, you know, notice the jets, I would see one and then I would see some white haze. But I never did take notice of really any notice other than some irritation when we hazed out. However, I can say that when I saw this particular day and I began to pay attention, I could hardly drive straight and I had to pull over all the time just to be able to look at these jets and say, look, this is not normal. I think that there were a lot of jets flying that day because there were many going in the same direction, leaving parallel lines. And in subsequent days, I would see many jets flying where the lines were parallel and there would be five or six or seven or eight all leaving trails at one time. And I thought that that was really peculiar that there would be so many. Later, I think that there were fewer jets, but that they would um, circle the county. 
and they go up one side of the county on the east side and they go down the west side and then they go up the east side and so they would move around the county in kind of a clock like um, moving around a clock later we discovered from talking to people in different counties that they were looping out over the pacific ocean and then coming back in and they were doing these huge loops discovered that from the size of one plume and watching one plume expand that they could cover our skies in solid cloud cover in about three hours here in mendocino county so that became my initiation and then i started to watch before work during lunch hour, after work, I started taking pictures and I started documenting what I was seeing because I thought that there was something wrong with this picture. I had never seen anything like this in my entire lifetime. My mother, um, who was in her 80s at the time, I showed her and she said, I've never seen anything like that in all the years I've lived here. Nothing. I went to look at NASA studies. And NASA, in their school program and also in their terminology and their research, began to realize that there was a brand new phenomenon that was occurring in which jet contrails, instead of dissipating relatively quickly, if you saw them in a few seconds, began to persist and grow. And NASA studies proved that they turned into man-made clouds that would change the climate, exacerbate global warming, impact natural resources. And they began to show pictures in on their website of clouds that look like these in the pictures next to me. They would show these pictures. And in showing these pictures, they were like what I was photographing in the skies above us. So I realized that there was a great deal of interest by many agencies and universities into looking at these and what effect they were having on the climate what effect they were having on raising humidity, what effect they were having on, um, in other words, what was going on with these that had changed, why they were persisting. But what happened was that they never did in any of their investigations. Most of the time they only looked at commercial airlines, they didn't look at military um, emissions and plumes. The second thing that they never did is they never took into account that that there might be something environmentally unsound about having our skies covered over with these clouds in the beginning. They just noted them, but they never addressed if anything was being sprayed or what, what changes in the jet or jet fuel or anything else was causing them. They scrubbed all that documentation, so all they did was identify them as persistent jet contrails. In order to gain some sort of credibility and be able to speak at the United Nations and speak at other areas, if I had used the word, for example, chemtrail, the United Nations would not have invited me as a keynote speaker because then I would have been talking about something that was listed on all these websites and by the Air Force, by NOAA and NASA as a hoax. So you, you don't gain the credibility of anyone or any group or agency when you just use the term. So it didn't behoove me to use it and so I refused to do so. NASA, first of all, in the late 1980s, initiated a schools program for children K through 12. And they started in some foreign countries and then they brought the program to the United States. And NASA began to have children uh, starting to count contrails because they said that their satellites and also that they couldn't count them from the ground. So therefore they needed school children to do this as part of a, a kind of like a game. I think that they really began to want children to think that this was a normal phenomenon. And so in the late 1980s, this program started to go through. When um, we offered to give our videotapes and our pictures and called up NASA and said, look, we'll provide this because we've done day-to-day, -day, time, date, everything. Um, on the pictures and on the videotapes. And NASA turned us down because school children, as they put it, were more reliable. Now, the other thing that was odd, I, I kid you not, this is what I was told. I mean, I was speechless at this point, but that's what I was told. So then the second thing I found out by calling the National Weather Service and I would ask them, are you on, you know, online, can you, are you looking at the satellite? And they said, yes. And I said, can you look over Ukiah? And they said, yes. And I said, well, can you see a jet, you know, leaving a plume? 